Well, for one, thank you everybody for coming out and joining us today. What a beautiful day for the arts, and it's beautiful to be able to celebrate Art of Noise, celebrate Washington, D.C., and to celebrate a wonderful, wonderfully talented artist sitting next to me. Do you want to introduce yourself? My name is Sudega Nzinga Terrell. Beautiful, beautiful. And so why don't you introduce the show real quick before we get started. Why are we here today? Well, this is my solo debut. It is called The Edge of the End of Everything. Um, it is work that is uh, mixed media and representative of like these um, casual moments that I think a lot of times we take for granted and don't even think about like all of the little beautiful things that are suddenly happening. But I also think there's this uh, collective experience going on right now where we're in some kind of parallel shift or it feels like we're just at the edge of the end of something mm -hmm. and like something new we are all kind of entering into and have been I think that there's like this process that's been happening since um, I would actually say like March 2020 when everything like turned off and then it just seemed like it turned back on real crazily in the summer of 2020, and I feel like we've been at like warp speed since then, and then like all of a sudden now, whatever we were, we are reaching our destination. Right, right. And so before we get started, I just want to say for one, congratulations on the show. Thank you. You had a wonderful opening. It was, a, it was packed, a lot of people, a lot of love, a lot of energy, fantastic pieces of work and art. You know, you have, uh, there's no space on the wall, really. And I love the colors, I love the frames, and I want to say I thank you outdid yourself. I think you did a wonderful job, and it's beautiful to see the growth. Thank you. And so you made a good point about this warp speed aspect, and I feel like we're all feeling that. And so how did that, um, I can see that didn't deter you at all with making the work. And so we'll just start off with it. How did, how did just the COVID season and everything like that affect you and your craft? Did it, did it make you stop? Did it make you... Keep going. No, um, and I'm gonna be completely honest, and I will say probably one or two things that might come across offensive that I don't need to come across offensive, but no. When COVID first happened for me, I had had, I had just had a, a, like an artistic breakthrough, mm -hmm. literally the week before everything shut down. I was at the house, my friend came in town, um, from Denver, I hadn't seen her since I left Denver. We were just having a great time, drinking and partying, just at, you know, at our house, having fun. And um, I went upstairs into my room, and this voice was like, take a picture. And I'm like in my robe. And um, so my husband came up and I was like, take a picture. And I was sitting in my chair, I had him take a picture of the baby sleeping in the bed. And um, Someone was like, paint this picture, it's going to change everything for you. And, you know, I didn't really know what that meant. That yeah. could be a lot of things. You yeah. know, maybe this one is going to make a lot of money. You're like, maybe. But what it actually was is, like, I went, the way I laid it out was a little bit different than what I had been doing before. And it just made sense. And I've always done collage. I've always painted. But not together at the same time and so it's a portrait of me sitting in my bedroom and um, you know I'm in my robe and you know it's a very sensual picture but there's also like a true motherhood picture because my baby is in the back and there, you know there's all these other things going on and so the next week everything closed and for me that meant that my husband was home now all day and so for the first time in probably 10 years, I could be in the studio for eight hours and just work straight. Isn't that beautiful? Oh my God. <laughs> There's like nothing worse than like having to paint in spurts and mm -hmm. having to like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to paint it for Take that juice off and go focus on something. Yeah. Works, and then, yeah. you know, when you have a bunch of kids, it's like I got a kid tied to my chest, like literally, and another one is screaming upstairs and like, you know, I can paint and then I got to go make pancakes and then I can come paint for two minutes and I got to go change and put Libby back on. And like, So it, it just, it, it was a lot of different multitasking that I think slowed down the, the way that I was able to progress. So it was beneficial for you. It was great. Like I was so, you know, I was really excited about that. But it was also like weird because we would take the kids out, you know, and you, we're like, <laughs> we, would, we came, I mean, one time we came downtown, nobody was out. We was driving down the wrong side of the street, like just to do it. 
Just to like, because like nobody, I asked my kid, you know, she's 10, I'm like, you wanna learn how to drive? Like, you can learn how to drive downtown DC. Like, right now, get in the car. She's like, no, we don't wanna crash. Like, you can't even hurt anybody. Like, nobody to crash into. You'll never have this chance again. And we would like go to the bar, because that's when they started to like, you could just drive by the bar and get food. And like, hell yeah. <laughs> let me drive, like we're driving past and just stopping and being like, let me get some some Jack Daniels. Right. And they just pour you a cup outside, like, get back in the car, like living life dangerously. It was great though. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> we had this time that we were really spending together, but I also wasn't able to then source what I wanted to paint from outside of the house. Right. It was like, I gotta paint my kids now because that's all I see. I gotta paint my babies. I gotta. So I painted a bunch of pictures of like us sitting around the house. Cause <laughs> what else is there? So I think that in those ways it was good. I, I was also really scared because you know when everything closes it, and you know I'm thinking about like collectors. Are they gonna still have money to keep making their payments and keep buying their pieces <laughs> and like? Cause that's how I feed my family. Right. So. Um, shows was the, you know, like all the shows got canceled. Like I had all these shows and it was like all at once, all the contracts, I had an education contract canceled. Like all these, everything got canceled and so it was like this kind of pause for a minute. Um, and then George Floyd got killed. And it was weirdly one of the best things to happen for not just my career, but like all of my art peer friends. And I think I'm still like kind of grappling with understanding how I feel about that because it the riots and everything afterwards put such a spotlight on black art and black artists and I already had a pretty tremendous social media following but I ended up on all these lists with like Lisa Butler and um, I can't pronounce her first name but uh, Crosby and um, all these like really well-known, incredible um, mixed media artists who feature black work. And everybody wanted to buy something from me. Everybody wanted to, so it was just like, all of a sudden, like, I'm the one. Yeah. And so it was it, it was very, very strange. unique experience. Yeah, it wasn't, it's, it hasn't been what I've expected it to be at all. Wow. Well, that's beautiful. It's, you was able to turn uh, lemons into lemonade. And, to, and the fact that you were able to have a breakthrough before the pandemic happened is very beautiful because you know, with all the drama that was happening, it probably wouldn't have came to you later. I can attest to that as well. So that's beautiful. So you're, tell us about the experience of what it's like to be your mother, your wife, your entrepreneur, your artist. And so what is your, your formula and balance and all that? You know, what is your, and we're gonna get into the work very soon, but I'm curious, what does a typical week look like for you with balancing your life as well as maintaining your, your uh, thriving art practice? Chaos. <laughs> um, you know, that's something I'm also kind of grappling with changing right now and with, with how it, it has shifted. I, you know, have always been, we homeschool our kids, um, we're a very involved family. Um, I have been, I've always been the type of wife and mother who, you know, I try to cook every night. We have dinner at the table every night, like we talk to each other, those type of things have always been really important to me. And so I think that before I, I was really interested in how to plan my work or plan my career to be as inclusive of my children as possible and as inclusive of my family as possible. But I think that they're tired of this now. <laughs> they're tired of coming to all these shows. They're tired of being at galleries all the time. So now they're bad when, when they come to the shows. And that's made me have to shift a lot about like, well, you know, you guys can't, you know, I have to figure out where you guys are going to be. Am, am I going to, and, and starting to kind of outsource more. And I think that that's difficult because we're supposed to be these perfect wives and mothers that can get all of those things done all the time. But if I'm honest, we were Uber Eats a lot. My kids eat McDonald's like a shocking amount of time during the week. <laughs> and I am like a really health conscious person, but I just don't have time. And, um, you know, we were talking earlier, I had to get a nanny um, for several days of the week because um, as things have, have shifted for, for us, it requires that I have actual office hours. And I have, you know, it's, 
I think one thing that's a misconception with art is that uh, when I talk to people and they ask like, well, what, what do you think made you successful? Uh, they think that like you just one day overnight, everybody loves your work. And it's not, it's like <laughs> I'm spending eight to 10 hours on the computer sometimes and sending out press releases and sending proposals out and tightening proposals and you know and I'm applying for stuff and if they tell me no like I want to have a meeting and critique tell me why so I can make it better which um, a lot of times I notice that people don't uh, follow up like that and they love to jump on a zoom with me and tell me what they would have loved to have seen in my proposal or in my work or whatever and just learning from that and having those conversations and then I study art a lot like I probably watch 10 to 15 hours a week on YouTube about techniques and color theory and art history and, um, you know, so I, it, it takes a lot of discipline. Yeah. I don't get up at, like, I'm, I have to be up and out and about no later than 8 o'clock and that's late. Um, I'm, I try to have a bedtime. I try to be in bed by 11.05. I set my phone now where it just cuts off. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it takes it takes a lot of discipline. Wow. Yeah, I, I can I totally understand that. Like, I'm tired explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of talking about art. <laughs> um, but so getting into the work, mixed media artists, I'm a mixed media artist as well. And as a mixed media artist, I understand the, the ritualistic aspect between you and your materials, right? So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your practice? Where do you source your materials? What are your, your favorite things to use? I see you got these phenomenal frames that are just so beautiful and enhancing the work. And I remember you were excited about that when you first got the wood to cut it. So just tell us about the practice of, you know, how do you make this stuff? Yeah, I got a new saw because my husband was acting up and I told him to get me a saw and I'll stop complaining. And he bought me a saw. So I, <laughs> I got a new table saw. I get a circular saw. So like, you go on my Instagram. I don't know if you saw my Instagram. Yeah, I saw you were excited. I saw, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I am really discovering how all of the things that I have ever done in art are able to come together right now, which is like a really beautiful thing. Um, I use a lot of paper. And so originally I was, I was a, an oil painter and then I moved to DC and switched to acrylic. I've always had a fascination with portraiture. Um, I felt originally that if I could paint photorealism, that would be my sign that you can now do whatever you want. And so a few years ago I painted, I was painting people's pictures basically for like their kids' birthdays, miserable work. But I was doing really good and I was like, okay, so these are, I understand this, now I'm gonna, do what I want to do. So um, I was just painting at that time just with the acrylic. And then I really started getting into decorative paper. Um, I love, there was a, a store in Brooklyn that just had all this like random art stuff and they had all this like cool paper scraps. And so I started getting um, paper scraps and kind of, I was doing um, shigiri, which is like torn collage. Um, portraits of women so kind of like this one in the corner here is Shigiri it's torn collage and so I was doing a lot of portraits like that and um and then looking for like more paper and more designs to add to that then I had a young lady who um was constantly contacting me on Instagram asking me about advice for collage work and she tried to redo one of my pieces um like like literally went to the art store and like tried to find an exact paper to like recreate it. And she sent me a picture of it and she was really excited. I was horrified. Like, and she didn't, it was an okay conversation and we're still cool because she just didn't really understand that like you don't do that. But for me, instead of being like super offended, I, it was a challenge to me of like, okay, as artists, it's just like when you have paint. We all have access to the same paint. We all have access to the same paper. And so how do I use it in a way that if it's, if my piece is hanging next to her piece or next to a, a Patrick Doherty's piece, he uses the same paper. How, do, how does somebody differentiate? And so that got me into um, dyeing paper. So I started to, um, I started, I learned paper marbling. Um, and then I started to learn about like textile um, dyeing. And then I wanted 
So I have these like cool marble papers, but I wanted more design aesthetic to them. So I learned how to do liner cut carvings. And I had known how to do them before, but I, I wasn't really into them, into them. But then I started doing those, so then I was like dyeing the paper and stamping the paper, and like, so now I have my own paper design. So some of these pieces have paper that is dyed, that is, is stamped, so it has these like one-of-a-kind elements to it. Then I started scanning them, so I print my papers out now, and like have, so I have all these different um, elements going on. Um, I get gifted African fabric from everybody. Like, people just randomly will hit me up and be like, hey, I've got this bad of fabric. Do you want it? I'm like, sure. Yeah, you're not cheap either. Oh, no. And, like, and, and when it's authentic, like, I have a friend who lives in Ghana, and she just mails me fabric. And, like, so I'm like, okay, I've got, like, all this cool fabric. And so then I'm starting to think I'm really into fashion. And so, like, I'm arranging their clothing and arranging how they look and, and using these different fabrics. But I'm also really interested in the textures. And so a lot of times, like, people, they'll, they'll, like, I'll do pieces that are in all paper, and people will be like, no, it's fabric. And I'm like, this is paper. No, it's fabric. And so, like, experimenting with, um, you know, what mediums I'm using on the paper, on the fabric, and then what I can do with them afterwards, and how people can't tell which is which. I love that. Um, I found out you could sew into the paper. Like, so I'm like, oh, running it through my sewing machine. And um, so there's a lot that, that is going on um, in the assemblage of, of each piece. I think that for me, I see moments and I'm like, I have to create that. So like, for example, the little girls, those are um, a friend that I, a childhood friend. Those are her daughters. And that's a picture that she put up on Facebook. And just like the interaction between them, I just was like, that has to be communicated. It has to be experienced by other people. It has to be felt. And just like, so all everything is, is really about like capturing those precious moments and, and assembling those moments. Wow, <clears throat> thanks for enlightening me on that. It brings me closer to the work. And congratulations on reaching this point in your practice to really have that relationship with their materials and you know knowing exactly what you want you know i know that's a real milestone in, in people's careers and everything like that and so um, getting into this show which i'm just really enjoying so much now that you've uh brought me a little bit closer to your world tell us about this show why why what was the uh the thoughts behind the show what are your favorite pieces in the show i know mine my, my favorite pieces are uh, the one right over there uh, with the two figures laying down. And the barber. Yeah, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, and it's, your, all your pieces have a bit of a cinematic quality of it. Um, it looks like just scenes in the day of life, but as if, you know, that the camera is it's really curated and the camera's like right up on your figures. So tell us about this show. So um, all of the figures in this show are um, experiences, encounters, or people who I have engaged with in the last probably six months. And so, like, <clears throat> excuse me, this new brother here, <laughs> he um, he plants, he posted this picture in a um, plant group, and it was like a mix. And so he posted it in a couple of plant groups, and in the black plant group, all the love in the world, plants without pants. All the love in the world, but <laughs> I'm in a lot of weird places. <laughs> but there was another group that he put it in that was more of like a mixed demographic, um, and people had a really interesting reaction to it. And what I loved about it is that I was just like, we don't see black men portrayed this way often, where they're he's just like he is out of the country in the jungle at an outdoor shower, just like relaxing with his natural hair. There is no guns, police, or any of that involved. It's just a like really peaceful moment. So I asked him for permission um, to paint the picture. And so, you know, a lot of the pieces have those type of stories or those type of backgrounds. Um, a lot of pe uh, pieces feature my children. So my youngest daughter is in this one, and she's with our dog. Um, and this is the girl and her dog. And I was excited about the girl and her dog because I went to see the James um, Van Der Zee exhibition and he had a photo that was a girl and her dog and I was like oh, I'm on like it just it was one of those like moments you feel in sync um these two are my oldest daughter and I'm thinking and both of them are really about experiences that she had this summer like 
we went to, um, she, I asked her what she wanted for her birthday. She said she wanted to go to New York. And I was like, okay. So we took her to New York. We took the family to New York for her birthday. And, and they took their skateboards and scooters and stuff and just had a really amazing time. Like, we went to um, Washington Square Park. And she was out there. She's not really a great skateboarder because I don't know how to, like, teach her how to do it. So she knows, like, the basics. But she was out there with, like, college students, like, skateboarding and just, like, that confidence and that freedom. She'll always remember that. I think so, and I will, too. And that's part of why I was like, well, I want to paint it because I want her to, like, remember. I think, you know, 12 is a, like, very scary time. And so, like, in that moment, she just was not concerned about what anybody else thought about her or she couldn't do flips and tricks she could only skateboard in a circle but it was the best circle she ever skateboarded in and like she loved it and then the other one is a, a conversation that we had about the masks because um not just her i think a lot of us are like really struggling with the obscuring of the face and all of the things that 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 means and so i have these two pieces that kind of address the obscuring of the face and you know with her just as a preteen, and I'm thinking about with my younger kids too, like they're not learning to pick up on certain social cues and certain facial cues, because like majority of, especially my little one's lives, everybody's face is covered. And so um, she and I had an experience once where um, my dad had surgery, so I went back to Denver. And she was two when I left Denver, so she doesn't remember Denver. She doesn't have any understanding of like her whole her whole experience has been in DC and in this area around black people. So we're in Denver and we're walking around, you know, we go to Target and we go in a restaurant and she realizes like this is the first time she's ever been in a room where we're the only black people in the room and it's a little bit unnerving. Um, and then we're walking through like Target and everybody's stopping or everybody's. And so she was like, why is everybody stopping to talk to you? Or why is everybody, all the black people giving you a nod? And I was like, oh, we let each other know if it's safe. The black nod. Yeah, you know, like, well, like that lets me know it's okay to progress. And like, you know, when something wild is going on, you know, we have the, like the little, those little cues, like. Yeah. And so I was, this was several years ago. And so her and I were having a conversation really recounting that. And she was talking about how there's so much that she's not able to pick up anymore and that she wonders about and, and we were wondering about like how that's going to impact how our children are going to relate in the future to one another because of that disconnect and just even the safety element you know like it's nothing worse than being at a gas station on Benning Road and somebody come in with weird energy and their whole face covered and <laughs> like what is about to go on like um, you know so just exploring all of those things so each of the pieces is really like kind of a reflection of just like what we're all kind of experiencing and what, what we're going through and how we are creating our safe spaces and our safe moments. You know, I have a um, date night because I haven't had a date night in forever because nobody babysits during the Rona. <laughs> um, and kids are disgusting. I don't blame them. My kids are like licking the cart and rolling on the floor at Costco. Um, it's not going to get the runner from anywhere to be from one of them eating boogers and whatnot. Um, so it's a piece just about like wishing to, to have that time, to have that those moments to to reconnect. Um, the uh, piece with the the pregnant couple. Please don't bring me pregnant energy. Um, <laughs> But just that thinking about, you know, I'm really tired and a lot is, is going on right now. And it, it feels kind of similar to like when you're about to have your first child and that's like the last time you sleep. <laughs> and like, cause once you have that baby, it's like full steam ahead. And then it, it's literally about three to four years before you ever sleep again. And I don't know, I probably haven't, like I have not slept in years through like the whole night. And so thinking about that and how kind of that's reflective of like this um, time travel situation that we're in that it feels like we're in right now and then I, you know my, my favorite two are the corner um and LeVar Burton and I like the corner because I have a, a corner like that in my house I'm really obsessed with collecting books I'm really obsessed with plants and so you know I really I like to build little areas in our um interior design and I'm really into like Afro-Bohemian decor and how that comes across in um our portraiture and in our scenic work. And so even with like LeVar Burton, 
is so much going on and everything has um, a textural quality to it because I think that's one thing that we do in our homes is like we fill our homes up with things that are so many colors and so many textures and and we arrange them. Um, I think that's something that's really very cultural for us. It's like how we arrange our space. I love going to black people's houses. It's curation. Yes, very much. And we take it very seriously. And I, when I when I was first thinking Can't about... Can't be tacky. Oh, no. Can't be tacky. Oh, no. And then, you know, I was really thinking, too, about how... I, I know growing up, I would say majority of us had a room in the house we weren't allowed to go in. Like, that's like a huge cultural thing. It's like our parents are, or, or go to your grandparents' house and they got all the furniture is covered in plants. All white, don't touch it. All white, why do we do this? And then all these like crazy statues and like, I mean, and only, only us, like I go to like my elder friend's houses and they have walls full of masks and, and combs and statues and just, it looks like you were going into the African shop whenever you go to their houses and, and they always, we all play music and we all have our incense. It's, it's just a vibe, it's an experience. And so I really wanted to like invite other people to experience what that is for us. Yeah, I can I can see a connection of it too. And it's, it's cool, We sometimes we take those nuances in our culture for granted, but they're just so very beautiful. Um, so we had the opportunity of speaking earlier in the week and you got to uh, just tell me a little bit of yourself. So I want you to share the story of how you got into the arts and how you came to DC. All right, wait, which, which one did I tell you? Because I will talk your ear off. Yo, no, I, know. I, want you to, I want you to share with us um, your transition of when you knew you wanted to be an artist and then your uh, relationship with DC that you've always had. Okay, so I always start out by telling people that um, I was the kid getting in trouble in second grade. I was selling the kids earrings. Okay. And every day they would line up in the morning and I, I had cut out all these little cardboard shapes the night before and whatever outfit they had on, I would color the cardboard to match. And they would stick the little post through and I was getting them for all the money. And then the parents was complaining because the kids was not eating lunch because they were giving all their lunch money. <laughs> Um, but I was like racking it up. I have always been able to sell some stuff. Like folks, I, I don't know what it is. I'm like, I got an idea. You're gonna buy something from me, and people are like, here you go. This <laughs> is a blessing. Um, but I also was the um, black genius in the family, and so you know, like you could be a, a basketball player or you can be the black genius. And so my parents um, put a lot into my education for me to become an attorney and go to an Ivy League school. I did not tell you, oh my God, my dad, so I got into Harvard, my dad was pissed. I was like, I'm gonna go to Hampton instead. I am tired of dealing with white people. And he was like, you, okay, he told me, this is like so anti-black, but he didn't even mean it like this. But he was like, you go hang out with the janitors. I don't care, <laughs> but you, you go into an Ivy League school. Hang out with oh the my God, I was like, dad, like that only pushed me to go to an HBCU more. Like who says something like that? Like, it's like that you're really friends with black people later. <laughs> like what? <laughs> he was right. Like in the long scheme of things, like you don't get into, the, everybody don't get into Harvard. And like, I didn't really understand, you know, I had, I was 16, 17, I was 17 when I graduated. So I didn't really understand like exactly the the weight of that. To me, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, because at that time, especially they were recruiting, all the schools just wanted more black kids to come. They had their little diversity thing. So they was like flying us out to all these different universities and stuff. And so it just didn't seem like that big of a deal to me. Um, but yeah, he was pissed. And he was like, you want me to get you some Popeye's biscuits to celebrate this? I was so mad. But he was right. <laughs> and I did not like it for all the reasons he told me I wasn't going to like it. Um, anyway, so I'm on this like fast track to, to be a journalist. Um, and I have this job at a newspaper and I hate it. It's draining. Um, they drink a lot. They smoke a lot. Like all the things that you hear about people in newspapers are true. Like you, I would pick up the phone, the phone, the receiver smelled like cigarettes. Like they chain smoke like that. It's disgusting. Um, and they drink. We would have meetings at eight o'clock in the morning at the bar across the street, and like, and they're like pouring, like not nobody's, not no like breakfast type of drink, but like 
shots of vodka. It's eight o'clock in the morning. Y'all done seven shots and smoked a pack of cigarettes. And we're like, now you're about to drive to a fire. Like, what is going on? It was just too much. And I was, I was drawing secretly on the side. And I thought, um, I want to have a black arts festival. So I had no idea what I was doing. Honestly, it's, this is probably the stupidest thing I've ever done because like who starts out and just is like, I'm gonna have a festival, like not a block party, not a event, <laughs> a festival. And I got lucky because um, the city had just built a new like Martin Luther King Plaza and they needed somebody to use it and like, perfect, a black arts festival. So they like super assisted in, in me help being able to put it together. And the day of the event comes and one of the vendors didn't show up. So I had a gap in the setup. And my mom was like, just run home, get your art, and stick it in there so that something is there. And so, you know, I just dumped some art in there. It wasn't that serious. It was something I was just kind of doing on the side. Um, prior to that, I had been, a, I was a spoken word artist. And so I had designed, like, my book covers and stuff, but nobody knew that that was my work. That was on the covers. So um, people were like, oh, you know, I like your work. And I ended up um, joining this collective, the Sankofa Art Collective, and they would do a, um, they would critique your work and let some people in, and so they critiqued my work, and she was like, this is not very good at all, <laughs> actually, <laughs> but she was like, I see that you got, that you have potential to be good, and so they let me in and would not let me show at any of their shows, <laughs> but I just sat at their feet and like listened and learned, and then they supported me. Like the next year when I had my festival, the whole collective came and all of them said. It's a and, mentorship though. Man, yeah. and just being quiet. I think that that's like one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in my life consistently is like when you get around certain people, just be quiet. Mm -hmm. And like, and especially, you know, like I, when I left Denver, I went to Atlanta and um, and that was, the, there was a brother who, he had a gallery space next to the gallery I was working out of. And um, I told him, I, you know, I want to, I want you to mentor me. He was like, I'm mentoring somebody else. And you know, I was just like, okay, well, I, so I just started going to get him lunch every day, mm -hmm. and just come sit in the studio. You need some oranges? I'll go get you some oranges. You need, you need a sandwich? I'll go get you a sandwich. Play the game. Yeah. Man, and so then finally he came to look at my work, and he was like, it's very primitive, but you don't know anything about color. And if you don't know anything about color, you're not going to be able to like progress. And for me, because I'm self-taught, I had never heard that you had to like know something about color. Like blue is blue. <laughs> and I was approaching things like, oh, I want this to be blue, and because I like blue and uh, whatever color, you know, it doesn't matter. And so he set me on this journey to learn color theory. And um, so then I left there and I came here. And um, I did not intend at that time to be in D.C., but I had been saying my whole life that I was going to be in D.C. And, like, I had always been talking about, like, I'm going to be a famous artist in D.C., and people would just be like, you're mentally ill. That sounds weird. Like, get a job and get your life together. And then I ended up here, and here we are. No, so the reason I found that story so interesting, I'm five generations Washingtonian and been here all my life. I've never heard anybody always want to come to DC all their life without ever even coming here. Just like that's where I want to be. So I think that's 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 beautiful. I'm glad you were able to find that connection with my city, with our city. And it's became a home for you. It's my city yeah, now. It's, hey man, it's, we at your show, it's your day. Your city? I get to be like honorary sometimes. Of course. You know, I know a couple of y'all slang words and whatnot. Now. <laughs> give, us, give us a slang. Oh word. no, y'all, you're not about to embarrass me and have everybody on <laughs> the Instagram like, uh, no, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> um. So as we as we uh, conclude, just getting to know you a little bit better. Just I've had the privilege of talking to a few different artists, and it's it's always interesting to hear um, artist rituals. You know. Um, their studio rituals that get them in the mood to create their go-to things. It could be movies, it could be music, whatever have you. So what is, what's your, what's your studio ritual? What's the thing 
that you you do to get you in the zone? You know, maybe what's your kind of music are you listening to? Are we gonna keep it real? Keep it real. Yeah. We no, <laughs> but a lot of high city. Um, <laughs> but for real, um, I I love I love podcasts. I love political podcasts. I listen to political podcasts probably all day. Um, and I like a lot of viewpoints. I like to listen to like I like like the people that everybody says are racist. I love to listen to their viewpoints um, because a lot of times they're not. It's just like this understanding of like who gets to say certain things. Like the St Stephen Crowder, for example, have the right to critique black culture. And if, if he's right, is it racist if he's right? Or um, I love like Candace Owens. I don't agree with her very often, but I, she's just a very- I do like her. She's so gorgeous. Are you so crazy? And oh my gosh, she's crazy. But she's beautiful and she's like really enigmatic. It's very entertaining and I'm, that that interests me like how can somebody be so ridiculous sometimes and so entertaining and so and and then but but i like the um i like the opposing viewpoints i like the the angela stanton kings and um i like uh who was listening to jason whitlock on the way here he be having me cracking up and got a sister on there on his show shamika i love her um and same things with like a kevin samuels so entertaining and I love um, I don't again I don't always agree with him and I think that it's kind of funny sometimes but the setup like the way the, the way his show comes on with the music and then the vibe that he creates with his suit and like wherever he's set up it has a little look to it that I really like Tasha K I love like just the way of watching her like presentation progress and Star Report is probably like my favorite thing to listen to because he's just like <laughs> shocking and hilarious and the people call in to troll and just be wild and it makes me laugh um, but it's nice to have things to listen to because I also get a lot of information. And so, you know, they might suggest a, a book or something that they're reading and I'll get the audio book and put that on. They might talk about a documentary they watch, and I'll find that documentary and put that on. So I'm like getting all of these different um, viewpoints and the sources for these different viewpoints. And um, I like the challenge of, I feel like we're in an era right now where if you disagree with somebody, like I don't like that, that cancel culture type of vibe. Like I like to disagree with people. I like to hear why you might feel differently about something. I, I like to respect that we might have the exact same information and have two different conclusions or two different ways that we go about getting to the same goal. And really, that's all I ask for is like, if we have a similar goal, then I'm down to hear what you got to say, whether I agree with it or not. Um, so, you know, I, I like that. It keeps my brain moving, I think, um, especially like as, I'm, as I'm working. And then, um, you know, too, because a lot of my um, following was built independently online, I also have to like engage with the algorithm, which is annoying, but um, those things help me be able to like basically, sorry y'all that are on my Facebook, but I have to troll y'all on my Facebook and like say things to make people come and argue because that's how the algorithm is set up. It, you have to feed chaos into it, and then it'll it, it will bring you people. And so, like being really caught up on the current events, I can come out and kind of harass or like poke the bear a little bit, and then I turn off my Facebook and <laughs> let everybody else argue, and then I post my picture. Like, oh, yeah, I just finished this. <laughs> um, and then I think my other go-to is like Mo Facts. Mo Facts is, is one of my favorite podcasts as well because he just the way he does research is phenomenal. And I think there's an artwork. In, in researching a point and, and presenting it over a series of like two hours of news clips and audio clips and like presenting these views, like there's art in that. Um, I am a super music head. I have a playlist for this show too. I forgot to bring it for the opening and I forgot to bring it today, but I'm gonna email it to everybody. I have a little link and y'all can just scan it, but I, I make playlists for stuff all the time. So I've got dozens of playlists. Um, I love like Spotify Shuffle or I'll put on somebody and then just let it go down whatever rabbit hole. I like all genres of music. And so sometimes uh, me and my friends kind of have a challenge of like, we try to send each other really strange, obscure things and see like, can I send you something that you've never heard before? 
Um, and if I like it, like I'll just put it on the radio and see who else Spotify says sounds similar and like exploring all these people. So I have like a playlist for like all the songs I like. Like if I like it, I'll add it to the playlist no matter the genre. That has like 3,000 songs on it. And I have a playlist that's like just all of these songs. Or these, you know, the vibe for this space. I have a, a playlist that's like my relaxed playlist. I have a, a gangsta rap playlist. I have an early 90s playlist. So sometimes it's like whatever the vibe is, like I'll turn that on. I usually don't listen to music until night because that's when I get the Jameson out. And, <laughs> and when the Jameson started hitting, <laughs> yeah, you know, so I didn't spend all day getting intellectual and then let the Jameson start hitting at night, get the, the music going, and then hopefully my kids go to sleep and I can have like a good hour or two. And if they don't go to sleep, they could go to their rooms. And I have like a good hour or two of just like in that vibe creating. The studio seems lit, like the place to be. We have a good time. <laughs> I have a really good time. And I like when people come to create too because I also have like supplies galore. And so like when other people come and kind of seeing them start to contemplate, like I have five or six different kinds of saws and wood everywhere. I have sublimation printers, heat presses, airbrush guns, uh, any kind of paint that you can name, bins of paper, three or four bins of just random fabric, like just stuff. Rolls of canvas, just stuff. You can right make anything. Now, Michael's don't got nothing on you. Huh? No, not at all. <laughs> what I, that was interesting to hear, I, or what I enjoy is um, I always like artists that are authentic, right? So all the things you're saying are your personality. So it's really cool to have that trans, like you don't, you don't act brand new when it comes to your art. It transfers over, you know. So that's 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 beautiful. Um, and so, wrapping up, why don't you let us know well, what else you have going on for you? Like, so you had your wonderful show here. I know you got a bunch of other shows planned. But what's your what's next on your plate in terms of the work, in terms of just your scheduling? Well, um, I, we have a couple of things happening. So, I, so I'll start with locally. My husband and I. Um, have been working to launch an art center in Ward 7 for a long time. And so we're in the process now of, of looking for a building and pulling together um, a funding to open this art center, but in the meantime have launched it virtually. So we have workshops that we've been doing um, through our website. Like I just did a four-week collage web, uh, workshop. He, he did a four-week uh, workshop on like painting African masks and the history of, art, of the art of African masks. Um, and so we're gonna start doing a lot more things like that um, next year, uh, including uh, my publicist is gonna be doing PR workshops and how to do like basic things, like how to announce that you have an event coming up. My accountant is gonna be doing some workshops about um, how to get your money together through your art and like how to set your business up because you know a lot of times we're not thinking about retirement. We're not thinking about we have kids, like how our money flows to our kids, like when you have a job that structures that. Or like right now, you know, we're young, we're healthy, we don't really, you know, I don't go to the doctor. We have insurance because my husband's a teacher. We don't really use it because we like holistic health more. Um, but just thinking about like there will come a time where I'm, or all of us might need medical care. And so making sure that we have our money set up to where everything is, is flowing how it needs to go in a professional way and thinking about like long term. And so I want to share those journeys with um, other people so that other people can start thinking about getting some of those things set up as well. Um, so that's what that's what we're doing locally. We This is the first of, I think, six solos that I got in the next year. And that's really absolutely amazing because I have been applying and applying and applying and applying and it's been no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden it's like, yes, 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 yes. At the same time. Though. All at the yeah. same time. And so I think I said yes to too much. <laughs> but we're going to make it happen. So we are opening um, two solos in Milwaukee. My husband has a solo and I have a solo um, in Milwaukee, January 15th. Those open, or January 7th, they open, um, but the reception, yeah, January 7th. 
And then January 15th, um, we are at Moody Jones Gallery in Pennsylvania doing a duo show. And we've done a couple duo shows before, but for this one, we're only showing pieces that both of us worked on together. So usually when we do a duo show, it's um, a hodgepodge of both of our works, and we put like one piece we did together in to kind of marry it. But this one is only pieces we did together, so I'm really excited about that. It's called The Bridge Between Two Houses. It's a mm. nod to Frida and um, Diego and, and what it is to be married to an artist. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, and then in April, um, opening a solo at the Abington Arts Center. And then in May, I'm opening another solo at BizArts. Um, and BizArts will feature um, a solo called The Many Rooms, which is the pieces I worked on from 2020 forward to the piece I talked about earlier, um, that, that was really the change, is, is one of the pieces in there, and um, some of the work, if you guys follow me and you see, um, I have a lot of, of work of just people sitting in, in the houses in different rooms, and so um, I'm excited about that because it, it has a music project that is happening um, alongside it with one of my favorite producers from Denver because I wanted to give it a sound that like sounded like me and sounded like, like where my people from. Um, so that is going to be debuting. Then I'm at the um, Virginia Art Factory in June and July. Um, I have some mural unveilings that are coming up that I can't uh, say yet because I got the NDA still. <laughs> it's a pack year. It's busy. <laughs> it's busy, but it's that's good, a blessing. Busy, yes. yes. Yes, because it, it could be slow. Yeah, Ooh, sure. man, this, all these pieces could continue to be stacked up against the wall in my basement. And <laughs> I'm just like really honored that they have places they can be. Well, that's a blessing. And congratulations to you Thank and all you. your endeavors and your successful solo show. And I'm pretty sure your community will continue to support and love you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who has come and purchased. And, you know, I, I know I am giving it my political spiel all the time that when we have personal success, it's important that we connect to others and we share our successes. And so, you know, when you're buying art for this event and the next two that we're opening up are black owned galleries. And that was important to us. I, I wanted my debut to be at a black gallery. Um, because all of these pieces that sold puts money back into this space, and this space has to be here. We need these spaces to be here, and it is our responsibility to uphold them and to, to keep them, and I think that's one thing culturally that we need to be a little bit more solid about. I couldn't have said it better myself. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out on this uh, another lovely artist talk at Art of Noise in Washington, D.C. I'm Jabari Jefferson, and I uh, look forward to having many more programs here. And thank you. <laughs>